Good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are listening today. Thank you all for joining me today for the first of our Columbia CBIPS lecture series on social justice and the AC industry. I am Fenioski Peñamora, Executive Director of Columbia Center for Buildings, Infrastructure, and Public Space, and Edwin Howard Armstrong Professor of Civil Engineering and Engineering Mechanics at Columbia's Fu Foundation School of Engineering and Applied Science. As the events of last month have demonstrated, we are living during exceedingly challenging times, characterized by divides, distrust, and distancing. However far apart we have been, however far apart we currently are, we need to learn to come together to be together, to act together for social, economic, and environmental justice. I hope that the events of these days bring better understanding of the injustices that exist and become a catalyst to bring about real change for all. Along with many of our colleagues in New York City and around the world, the faculty and staff of the Center for Buildings, Infrastructure, and Public Space we like to add our voices to those describing institutionalized racism in the AC industry. Today, our industry has challenging work ahead to achieve true racial and gender inclusion. We need to stand with our architects, engineers, contractors, and suppliers from underrepresented and marginalized communities. We need to listen better, to learn better, and to incorporate the lessons of diversity and distress into the way we, working together, can reshape economically disadvantaged communities. We need to build a better future for our industry characterized by respect, opportunity, and collaboration. From mid-May to early September, our COVID-19 lectures brought people together to address the impact, response, recovery, and preparedness of the architecture, engineering, and construction community in regard to the coronavirus pandemic. The talks also related of issues of social, economic, and environmental justice to the new normal post-COVID-19 AC world. Our speakers in the series were from Beijing, Boston, Chicago, London, Los Angeles, Porto Alegre, Paris, Sao Paulo, Seoul, Washington DC, Wuhan, and of course, New York City. The 19 weekly lectures in the series can be seen on our website, cbips.engineering.columbia.edu. Today, as we start our new series on social justice and the AC industry, I would like to thank the organizations with whom we are cooperating in presenting these lectures. They are the American Council of Engineering Companies, New York, I would like to thank Jay Simpson for their support. The American Institute of Architects, New York chapter. I would like to thank Ben Prosky and of course, Suzanne Max. Suzanne is today our co-moderator. The American Society of Civil Engineers. I would like to thank Tom Smith. The Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization. I would like to thank Lance Brown. The Construction Management Association of America, New York and New Jersey chapter. I would like to thank Vinnie Forkowski. Engineering News Record, I would like to thank Jan Tuckman. And the, Nas the National Academy of Construction, I would like to thank Wayne Crew. And also, I would like to thank NICOVA, NOMA, the National Organization of Minority Architects, based here in New York. And I would like to thank Samantha Josephath for their support. My co moderator and respondent today is Suzanne Max, the managing director of the American Institute of Architects, New York chapter. Suzanne has worked on staff at the AIA New York for over 20 years, most recently with the membership and program team. AIA New York seeks to span efforts to grow member value, deepen community engagement, and guide professional development. She works closely with members architects who are pursuing elevation to the AIA College of Fellows, emergency profession, emerging professionals developing mentoring relationships through the TORCH program, and with a member-driven advocacy team. Suzanne is a graduate of Harvard University and co-chair of the Facing Racism Action Group of the First Presbyterian Church of New York City. Thank you, Suzanne, for being here today. 
The speakers for today's program is Justin Garrett Moore. Justin is a transdisciplinary designer and urbanist and serves as the executive director of the Public Design Commission. He has extensive experience in architecture, urban design, and planning. From large urban policies and projects to grassroots and community-based planning, design, and arts initiatives. At the Public Design Commission, his work focuses on prioritizing quality and excellence for the public realm and fostering accessibility, diversity, and inclusion in New York public buildings, landscapes, and art. He's a member of the American Planning Association, ACP Commission, the Urban Design Forum, and the Black Urbanist Collective, Black Space. Justin is an adjunct faculty member at Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, and the Yale School of Architecture. His social enterprise, Urban Path, focus on sustainable development through social and environmental design projects in the United States and Rwanda. He holds a Bachelor of Design from the University of Florida and a Master of Architecture and a Master of Science in Architecture and Urban Design from Columbia University. To learn more about our speakers and co-moderator, please visit the CBIPS website. Justin, thank you for being here with us today. The screen will be just yours after I make this transition. <laughs> So let me just. Yes, great. And thank you so much for uh, the introductions and, and for putting together uh, you know, this important panel and this important discussion. Um, the, the conversations around social justice and the built environment are, are really key, uh, especially as we're entering these conversations today. Um, so I have a number of different projects and images that I'm going to show you. There's a lot of images, so forgive me, but uh, I, I want to give kind of a broad uh, kind of point of entry for this work. So this first image is a simple one. This is of Ville Platte, Louisiana. Uh, and you'll see that this is just America, right? It's a piece of, of urbanized territory, and we see this road. And I've outlined these two red lines. Uh, these two red lines are kind of the work that someone like an engineer or a landscape architect or an architect or a planner would have drawn somewhere, right? They drew these lines. But what's important to recognize is these lines confront issues of justice. You can see that there's no sidewalk in this image. And so the, the public realm, the right of way is really dedicated to cars. Seems innocent enough, right? But the issue is, is that this space, the built environment, the work that engineers and architects and planners have done has made an unjust space. You see, a few years ago, uh, three teenagers and, and a young man were walking down this road. They were walking, it was started getting late at night and they were hit by a truck. When they were hit by the truck though, what happened was is that the, the young men and the teenagers were arrested and charged with a misdemeanor for walking in the roadway. The issue is, is there's no sidewalk. Where else were they supposed to walk, right? This space of, of inequality that privileges someone who can afford a vehicle became something that we all as people in the built environment professions have to take more responsibility for. You could complain about the police, why were they charged, all of these things. But the question is equally, why wasn't there a sidewalk in a predominantly black and low income community where most people of a certain age range can't afford to have a car, right? Injustice is built into our environment. And so there are some basic questions that we have to ask. And this is from something called the New Frontier Plan uh, which was done by a group of, of Black uh, kind of community development folks in Indianapolis where I'm from originally. And it has some basic questions. What is it about? About people, about their needs, their abilities. It goes on to say it's about what people know and don't know and what they ought to know, ought to know to help make America still greater. And so as we do the work of talking about justice and and design and space and cities and urbanism, we have to have a number of different considerations or principles that we're focused on. Principles like really understanding and caring for space, 
promoting and ensuring equity for all different kinds of people. But also understanding that our work has to be uh, sort of rooted in understanding the details, right? The detail of uh, the curb of providing a footpath for pedestrians, for example. Uh, and that ultimately our work is, is to provide for comfort, uh, you know, really that our work is, is for people. And so we have to negotiate this at many different scales that can be at the city scale, large policy, zoning, transportation systems. It could be the scale of a building or a neighborhood, kind of the character of, of, of place. And ultimately we're responsible to the scale of human experience. Um, but people that have done this work, and uh, this is the organization chart of the city of New York, know that there are all these different agencies and departments and stakeholders from the people to the mayor to the commissions and boards that all have influence on built environment design. Uh, and I'm uh, lucky to be uh, a member of what's called the Public Design Commission, uh, which is a city agency where design matters. But the problem is that we're often in these silos, right? Everyone has their rules and regulations uh, that are sort of shaping the environment and we're not always doing a good job of connecting it. But we have to do a better job of breaking outside of our silos and doing work to coordinate the design of the public realm and to recognize that the way that people experience their city is not in all of these kind of silos and divisions, whether they're disciplinary or by jurisdiction or by sector, they just experience their community and we all are involved in doing the work of ensuring a, a just environment. And so I have a few couple examples I wanna share uh, that have been involved in a, at the Design Commission. So we talk about justice, right? So there are different kinds of places and this is a kind of place that you might find. Uh, you'll notice that the, the, the uh, woman in the front has a mask on. This image is from long before COVID-19, right? There are geographies in our cities that people needed to wear masks to exist in the space long before the pandemic. This is a site called the Spofford Juvenile Detention uh, Facility that was in the South Bronx, and it was a kid jail. This is where public investment went to incarcerating youth uh, in a predominantly black and brown community uh, that had issues like uh, kind of poor environmental conditions that it created in its neighborhood. And so the city embarked on what to do with this space, this space of injustice in the city, uh, which took up sort of nearly a, a, a full uh, block of, of territory in the South Bronx. And so what that process looked like was to actually go and talk to people, right? So radical idea number one, before you've determined everything, what the goals are, what the objectives are, you can simply do the work to create space to talk to people, to learn what a future may look like or what justice may mean or what of the objectives of the change of a space may be. Oh, it's going back. I'm sorry. Let me get back to my slide here. And so some of the work that was done here was looking at things like jobs and community development, working with uh, people that are in uh, the neighborhood already and have businesses and enterprises that they want to incubate and support. Or looking toward, um, uh, sort of prospective tenants of the space. So things like bakeries, uh, kind of different types of businesses or things like banks, the need for uh, services. And so in this project, what we've been able to do is to design into the foundation of this space in this project, creating different spaces like for local retail and small businesses, uh, like providing for open spaces uh, and uh, design and development, uh, things like childcare and healthcare and artist studios, uh, but also creating spaces for things like health facilities or fresh food grocery that are built into uh, this site and this project as it's reimagined for justice, all connected by public space, a public realm, a way to sort of collect uh, people in place in ways that, that communicate a different kind of approach uh, to community and accessibility and justice 
That, of course, included things like affordable housing and conversations around affordable for whom. But what we're able to do in projects like this is to reimagine our spaces and think about how we center people and how we center community and community needs. And the public realm and good design are a part of that. Something I'll note about this project is that not only is it designing a great space and, and providing housing and all these wonderful things, it's also providing opportunity, opportunity for jobs, opportunity for control and authorship. Um, this project has a black architect and a black landscape architect, uh, Victor Body Lawson and Elizabeth Kennedy that have helped design and create this space. And so the last point I'll say about this project, which is an important one is that we don't only need to do good projects, new things, new work. We also need to acknowledge the full responsibility of our work as professionals, uh, our responsibility of our work as uh, members of our community, our collective space. And that sometimes achieving justice requires dismantling something. So this is the groundbreaking for this project, which isn't, you know, the normal people with the shovel and the, kind of the ribbon. Uh, they've got the, their mallet, they've got their hammer because they're demolishing the injustice that had been done in this community for a long time. So another kind of project is a, a different kind of approach and talks about other uh, kind of modes of operating. And, and the idea that, that black people, brown people, people of color, black and indigenous people, right, all the, the new terms that we're throwing around, uh, but just people of all kinds need to have space. They need to have their culture. They need to have joy and experience. And so there is a large redevelopment project in, in New York City uh, called BAM South, uh, which is in the, what was once called the BAM Cultural District, and now the Brooklyn Cultural District. Uh, and this was a large redevelopment project and the design of the public space was a big question and concern, right? Big redevelopment, it's gonna be for the white people and the high income people and gentrification. But we had to bring the design conversation in to talk about, well, how do we actually design a space so that it's not for uh, only the new people and only for uh, kind of a certain scale of investment? And so as a part of this big redevelopment project, which had grocery store and cultural space and affordable housing and market rate housing, there was a large plaza space that was being designed. And so as we were designing this plaza, we worked with a lot of different types of stakeholders that all had different wants and needs for the design of that space. So space for the vendors, space for people to gather and to have performances uh, and, and have different kinds of activities. And so this is the rendering, right, and the idea that you could actually design and build a space that was inclusive for many different types of people. Uh, I know this image has stairs, but there are really well-designed kind of ramps and other access for full accessibility for all different kinds of people. And then what's great is sometimes you do this work and rendering can become reality and you can create a space that in reality, and this is an actual photo, that you really are bringing in different kinds of people to use the space by design, creating inclusive spaces, green spaces, places of, of rest and spaces of, of kind of relaxation and, and health uh, that can happen in the city. But it's also, despite all the multi-million dollars of investment and all the new people and all the new uh, kind of players, that this is still a black space. The black community that's been in Brooklyn for a long time still has access and ownership and the ability to exist uh, and have joy and have and express their culture in this space, right? And so as a project that had a kind of a public responsibility, justice looks like making sure that black people still can exist in their space and in their city. And so, you know, all of this is, is kind of a prompt for kind of work that's happening at, at big scale, but something that we also have to do in our field uh, and in built environment design is to think and talk about our history. And our history is a problematic one and it's been one that is uh, structured by injustice. But I'm not gonna necessarily talk about all the injustice, I'm gonna talk about a positive. We have to do the work of going back and acknowledging the work of people that have done good things for our cities and our, for our built environment. And so I return again to the statement that I started out with, uh, and I, I mentioned it, right, the, the Flanner House, a group of Black community uh, leaders and community members that came together to, to build uh, their community and their city. And they did it in a different way, and they did it by asking these basic, basic questions. What is it about? 
about people, about their needs, their abilities, what people know and don't know and ought to know, right? Remember this, what is it about? When you're doing your projects, when you're working with a client, when you're working together as professionals, what is it about? And so, sorry, I have a lag here. And so um, this gentleman was my grandfather. Uh, some people say I favor him quite a bit, uh, but his name is Albert Allen Moore and he did work in Indianapolis as a part of the Flanner House. And his what is it about question was about health. Uh, and so in this image, he's got all this food. Well, what Albert Moore did is he ran a large urban agriculture program in Indianapolis in the 1940s. Um, so this isn't an image of some farm in the South or something. This is an image of a large urban agriculture program in the city in Indianapolis that served lots of different people. It served uh, veterans returning from the war. It served young people who were uh, out of school or didn't have different opportunities. It served families and, and people across generations to have access to uh, fresh and affordable food. And they even built an infrastructure for things like canneries uh, or even uh, uh, community centers where they would teach people uh, how to cook uh, affordable and fresh and healthy meals uh, in their community, in their place, using the resources that they built together. And so what is it about again, right? How did they do that? How did they kind of do this work? Uh, the image on the left is a sociograph. This is where they started their work by going into their community and they talked to everyone. Literally, they talked to literally every family in the community and started to map out what are the connections, what are the relationships, but also what were the needs, what were their abilities, right? Asking those questions. What, do pe what did people know? What did they not know? And understanding and creating an environment where they could do the work of justice, where they could do the work of health, where they could do the work of economic investment and opportunity. And so what they did after doing that work was this incredible project. So, you know, while the, the dominant paradigm or things like large scale demolition, uh, public housing developments, segregated public housing developments, uh, white people somewhere deciding what's good for black people to fix the city and the Negro problem and the urban problem lots of architects and construction firms, people were making big money treating black people like terrible second-class citizens during this time, right? And you probably learned about it and valorized some of these people that were doing terrible things to black people. And what, you, what was happening is we learn about that, but we don't learn about this because this is erased. What black people did to make a just environment, to make a good community is erased from our history. So what they did is they got together and they, uh, got a fund, a revolving loan fund, and they platted out a land. It included parks, it included houses, um, it includes uh, uh, what was one of the first large-scale self-help housing construction programs. So long before Habitat for Humanity, the Flanner House built this development, which was to uh, have people build and design their own homes, right? And so this is the community that they built over time we see that they built this space and that it's able to persist over time despite urban renewal, despite university expansion, and it remains an affordable place in the city today. And so the work that we've, we've done uh, now is at Urban Patch, which is an organization I do independently, is to recover some of this history of Flanner House. Uh, and we've done projects which are to simply take abandoned houses and abandoned lots uh, and improve them, like this old vacant house uh, that was in our neighborhood, and we simply fixed it up and did it in a way that's affordable housing, right? Uh, or taking vacant land and vacant spaces in the community and doing work with community members to improve it and do things like uh, providing community gardens or working with young people uh, to beautify the neighborhood with things like public art and to bring uh, kind of repair to the spaces. But it's also about economic opportunity, uh, where we're hiring people from the neighborhoods to work on our different projects, uh, or to learn how to uh, kind of work together in community around things like food access, uh, or even planting trees and beautifying the neighborhood, and doing things that really connect neighbors together uh, as, as the community is changing. And so, oops. 
sorry. It's going the wrong direction. On and so uh, work that we've also been doing is uh, to expand this work uh, in other contexts and other places. So these are global issues. Uh, so at Urban Patch, we've done work in Kigali, Rwanda, which looks at kind of a scalable housing development model inspired by Urban Patch, where we're analyzing things like zoning and financial models, uh, site con context and constraints, uh, but really working to develop in place and provide jobs and provide opportunities that are led by uh, Black people, by Rwandan people, uh, to build and design affordable housing uh, with quality and care, right? Again, building in opportunities for jobs, building in opportunities for people. And so this is work that is literally building justice, right? Building uh, kind of ways for people to, to have quality. And, and this is uh, the, the final project, which is, a mixed income uh, housing development in Rwanda. And so I'll end with uh, a, a look at uh, work that I think is important to offer, which is about how do we think about our spaces in our cities? Uh, and this is a, a, a group that I'm a part of called Black Space. Uh, Black Space is a, a collective of Black urbanists, architects, designers, uh, that is working with, oops, no, it's going too fast. That's working with this idea for how do we do our work in community and with community and to co-create and to just operate in a different way. And so the idea of, of connecting with other modes of practice is something that we have to challenge, right? So we're all kind of educated in our different fields of expertise and we operate in our different kinds of environments, whether you're in an academic environment or a private sector environment or a government environment. And there are all these structures that frankly have a lot of built-in inequality and injustice. And it can be hard to move and operate those structures. I get it. I've, I've worked in government for 15 years. Uh, but we have to push some of these, these structures and systems that we know don't work for people. And so at Black Space, we've been doing that and we put together what we call the Black Space Manifesto. Uh, this is work and ideas that we're doing uh, to really challenge and push uh, uh, our practices and to think about things like justice, to think about uh, how is diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, more than just a tagline and an empty promise, right? And we, we have to push and challenge that quite a bit. Um, and so Black, the Black Space Manifesto is work that we did, uh, generated in a community called Brownsville, Brooklyn. Some of, you that, some of you that are in New York probably know it well. This is a community, it's predominantly Black community, predominantly low income community. And it has a lot of the issues that, that we kind of know uh, exist in, in many cities. Uh, you know, poor educational outcomes, high crime, high unemployment, um, and, and a number of different concerns, poor, poor health. Uh, and so we started working in and with the community and, and we're really being conscious of a lot of the, the bad practices and baggage and malpractice that we brought in as professionals in planning and design and, and policy, et cetera, coming into the situation. And so we created this, this sort of series of, of principles and ideas, uh, like create circles, not lines, create less hierarchy and more dialogue, inclusion and empowerment, right? How do you do that when, when you're doing work with built environment with big budgets and big policies and projects? You have to do it by doing it, right? You have to kind of check your assumptions and, and practice in a different way. Another important principle that we learned uh, kind of working in and, and, and with people in the community and, and something that really should happen just in general with any relationship that you have, could be your, your partner or your child, right? Move at the speed of trust. Grow trust and move together with fluidity at whatever speed is necessary, right? So the work of, of building trust and figuring out what kind of the pace and process is, is also important. So I won't read all through all of them. You can go to blackspace.org and, and uh, find the manifesto and download it and, and find it as a reference. 
but it's important to do this this uh, kind of reevaluation for how you're practicing uh, from from kind of the norms and best quote unquote best practices that somehow end up harming uh, lots of people and communities, even though it's a best practice. Uh, another important one, reckon with the past to build the future. And I, I intentionally included uh, references from the past uh, to, to uh, sort of prompt some of these conversations. And finally, uh, you know, manifest the future uh, is something that we all hopefully collectively have interest and responsibility uh, in doing. And, you know, I'm a, a black male, uh, so I grow in, in my life and experience kind of with that subjectivity and that, that uh, perspective and point of view. And I know from a very uh, uh, kind of direct way how much harm has happened to communities like mine or even to my own communities directly. Uh, and so I center the idea of manifesting the future to be one that is just, that Black lives matter, that Black spaces matter, right? Black culture matters, right? So all of these ideas and kind of chants and, and, and taglines have to translate into something. And since I'm a built environment professional, it's my work and job and responsibility to translate Black Lives Matter into Black built environments, right? Or our collective built environments or natural environments and making sure that everyone has access to a good outcome. And so what that is and what that looks like takes a lot of different forms, a lot of ways. It could be long-term projects, short-term projects. Uh, this is Osborne Plaza in Brownsville, Brooklyn, uh, where there's, uh, you see at the, the, for the distance of, of, of the image that, um, you know, the uh, public housing at one point tore through the fabric of this neighborhood with the tower and super blocks and all of that. And this was a little dead end street that had become a place of, of, of frankly, crime and, and uh, you know, poor conditions. Uh, but through design, uh, Brownsville Community Justice Center, people like Made in Brownsville and many others are investing in and contributing to what it takes to redesign uh, a space like this for justice. Um, so with that, I'll um, transition into our questions and discussion. Thank you. Justin, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, um, it was really covered so many uh, amazing projects and I think uh, I'm sort of a, a little overwhelmed to think about which are the appropriate um, places to start. But one of the things that I think you consistently showed is the importance of bringing in communities um, beyond just the client who maybe is the traditional person that an architect uh, collaborates with. And I wonder, you know, what how do you think that architects can help to expand that um, that collaboration at an early point to bring in the community and not just the client? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you, Suzanne. This is a really important question and one that I, I think we really have to push the entire ecosystem of the industry to reframe what our quote unquote scope of work is, right? So very often architects or even engineers are hired in when a lot of decisions are sort of already made or set in motion by a client. And the clients tend to be either wealthy people that have, you know, historically been advantaged by, um, to be frank, white supremacy and racialized capitalism and all the other uh, horrible things that, that have shaped the world that we're in, or things like a large government or kind of other institution that uh, isn't always going to be responsible to uh, kind of the broadest number of constituents. And so we have to do work to get the field and the, the profession and, and the clients to invest more in the work of understanding context. Uh, to understand people in place, 
uh, to understand environmental considerations, right, as core to the work, right? Not as something like, oh, it's nice if you can do that, and then we do our real paid work, right? Or we'll get a consultant, we'll hire some black and brown people to be our community engagement consultants, and they'll go and, and be the interface to, to check a box, and then we'll go do our real work, which is significantly more invested in, in terms of time, money, labor, and, and people power, right? So that's, that's something that has to be a challenge from the industry itself to say when you're doing the work, well, we're only going to do this work if, right, X, Y, and Z considerations get to be built into our process because we, we can't ethically do our job without doing that. And this is the other piece of this, is the ethics of all of these fields need to be synchronized, right? So that, you know, the engineer, that, that first image I showed of, of that street in Louisiana, it was unethical for the engineering firm that did that project to do that. And then whoever, the, you know, came behind them and did everything else, right? So there has to be a conversation about what is going to be the standard and base for how people do built environment work across all of the sectors, right? And so I've done the work, I've gone into every organization's codes of ethics and they're terrible. They're weak intentionally and they are out of sync. And so there are tons of gaps that allow bad things to happen. So one is working together to shore up your code of ethics and, and then you make each other responsible to that. And then if you do it in, in a group, then the whole field is responsible to it, right? Your clientele is responsible to it, right? So that, that's one kind of easy step. The second is that, uh, frankly, a lot of people in these fields are very poorly educated or experienced when it comes to addressing these issues, right? Oh, okay, we'll do a PowerPoint. Do you like version A, B, or C that all of us that have power already came up with as an option? And then, you know, you like it or you don't. And that being broadly, widely acceptable is insane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? It's, 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 it's really, like, crazy when you think about it. Um, and you have to kind of take responsibility and scrub those out of your practices. And, and get uh, uh, kind of a higher level of education and awareness and responsibility to doing that uh, ac across industries. Thank you. I, I, I would like to thank you again, Justin, for such a, a wonderful presentation. I really appreciate it, both the historical perspective and the future uh, anchor. I, I think those are very important. Sometimes people see the world as photographs and do not see the continuation of the different um, kind of actions that are made and how does that define you in the present, but also uh, it will define society in the future. So I thought that was very well taken. I also would like to thank Suzanne for um, that, that important question uh, about, you know, how do you bring everything together and your uh, response of that it takes the collective. It's not only the architect, the designer, but also the engineers. And, and I really like your grounding on by going back to the ethics um, uh, and the ethical canons of our profession. And I think we have seen that, for example, in the American Society of Civil Engineers, where there has been discussion. And again, how do you support to do the right thing? And I think you are also going back uh, to the point of doing the right project. So it's not only doing the right thing, but also doing the right project. And I think that's what you're talking about. What are the right projects for communities that have been disfranchised and communities that have been affected? And I would like to uh, I kind of bring up a question that is from one of our um, uh, members of the audience and also a uh, vice chair of our advisory board at CBIPS and the senior vice president, one well, of the senior vice presidents at AECOM, Marcos Diaz Gonzalez, who actually wanted to thank, first of all, uh, you for your commitment to public service at both uh, New York City PDC as well nationally and globally. And also, uh, thank you for your powerful uh, presentation. And his question goes to, could you talk about the efforts that New York City 
uh, is making or needs to make in terms of park access and specifically access to the waterfront from the point of view of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So if you can talk a little bit, I know that, you know, we have Mitch um, uh, Silver, you know, our Commissioner of Parks, and he has been doing a lot of things in terms of Parks Without Borders and different initiatives. But I think you, in your role in PDC, looking at all the different projects, not only from Parks, but EDC and others, you may be able to give a little bit more holistic view on this issue. Sure. Yes, thank you. I appreciate the, the question. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, things like parks and public realm are really the best evidence that we have for issues like equity and justice in the built environment, right? You could, you could just see it, right? Go to certain neighborhoods and the degree of investment in care may be one situation. You go to other neighborhoods and it's something else. It is, it's plain as day. Uh, so absolutely from a kind of a city policy level, uh, uh, you know, Commissioner Silver, Commissioner Parks and Recreation has done an incredible amount of work, literally shifting the, the dollars and the power to communities that had not seen investment for, for generations. Uh, so Community Parks Initiative, Parks Without Borders, uh, and Anchor Parks are large scale multi-million dollar investments in the geographies kind of outside of kind of the, the wealthiest and whitest communities that, that have tended to receive those resources. Uh, and it's a significant effort uh, and a great effort. Uh, the reality though is, is that it's a, a, a moment of time, right? That that has been happening. And so it's, it's, it's a, a, a little bit of uh, 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 something that needs to be done for generations. Uh, to, to really start to balance things out. Um, and, you know, to, to the question about the, the waterfront, that's something that I worked on for a very long time uh, prior to my PDC roles at the Department of City Planning. And so I worked on just about every waterfront project in Brooklyn and Queens over uh, the past 15 years. And so, you know, there it's, it's a challenge because we have to enter some bigger conversations like the ownership of property, for example, uh, sort of different assumptions about uh, uh, kind of capital and investment that uh, still drive a lot of the, the private territory that exists on the waterfront. Uh, and so there are mechanisms like zoning and, and uh, waterfront access and things like that, that we've been able to achieve um, some uh, provisions for, for providing for public space and, and inclusion. But the, the reality is as much of the private development relies on new people coming in, new residential development, office development um, to make it all work. And those don't tend to be black and brown people, right? That a, a big real estate developer is, is targeting. Uh, there are things like affordable housing that can provide for some income uh, 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 diversity, but when it comes to kind of racial uh, and other forms of diversity, it's, it's tougher. And so the city where it has the opportunity in, in, in kind of city ownership can do more. And so the Hunters Point South development is an example where the city did at, at a pretty large scale of new waterfront development, providing not only for a significantly greater amount of affordable housing, but a very, very high quality park, right? It is a public space that is not you know, uh, Battery Park City or, or even the Brooklyn Ridge Park kind of model. It is a public park that we all collectively, all New York City invested in to create a, a space that, uh, uh, that, that everyone truly has access to. So when the city has land, it's easier. Uh, on the private sector side, frankly, it's very, very challenging because you're still up against capital, right? As, as the driver and the objective and equ equity, social diversity, all those things uh, come into tension. And so we have to rely on our public processes and public conversations to push, but it, it's, there's still kind of a, a, a major, major headwind with what makes a feasible uh, real estate development project on our waterfronts. Justin, I have a question, another question from the audience, um, this time from Oral Selkridge. Um, and 
he, I think it ties in well uh, with some of the things you were just talking about because it's uh, about, you know, generational wealth and, and uh, with property ownership. Um, this question is, you know, if one of the obstacles that has been identified um, to equity is and positive growth in the Black communities is, uh, has been the lack of access to the ability to build generational wealth uh, through land ownership and, and home ownership. Um, if you spin that and think that that wealth maybe resides at this point, as you were suggesting in the traditional understanding of different things like uh, the agricultural and then tying that to, um, as your father did, to the ability to shift that into food production and, and uh, provision of healthy foods. Um, what do you think are the opportunities now for that kind of teaching and knowledge sharing from generation to generation? Sure, it's, I, it's, it's an important conversation. Within the, the Black Space Manifesto, uh, one of the principles is cultivate wealth. Um, and in, in there, it, it says a few important things. Um, it, it talks about time, talent, and treasure, right, in, in equal, right? So there are different kinds of wealth. So wealthy people immediately associate with money, but you also can have a wealth of time, right? The ability and space to kind of dedicate to something. Uh, or you can also have your different talents and skills, right? And so if you sort of reimagine wealth with these sort of different poles, uh, you, you get a little bit of a different dynamic. The other piece of that is uh, uh, in, in the manifesto is it, it talks about the freedom to risk, fail, and grow. And so this is something that frankly, people that have had access to money uh, you know, a lot of white people have had that ability to take risk, to fail, and to grow. Black people don't have that in America. Even the wealthiest black people don't have that in America, right? And so we have to totally reframe conversations about wealth to, to acknowledge that. And so frankly, that's where a lot of the conversations about uh, reparations come from is that there's been this huge kind of deficit uh, across generations and generations that that even if you were to get give land or, or money or access right there's a generation where a lot of, of black people are like oh here's a homeowner grant program and buy your house well then the problem was uh, foreclosure crisis and predatory loans you know you still failed you did everything you were supposed to do and you still, the system still was not set up in a way that you could, could be successful. So we have to look at all of those kind of full dimensions of wealth and opportunity and to dismantle the systems that are keeping people from being able to pass things on to the next generation. And the, the idea of kind of uh, sharing of knowledge and sharing of culture and experience across generations is definitely a key part of that and, and should be honored because that is a source of, of, of power and, and opportunity. But we have to, at the same time, actively dismantle all the things that are preventing people from using them, right? So land ownership uh, is great. Uh, that's a way to give people more security and control is not to just provide uh, uh, you know, a job but it's to provide wealth, right? Income is not wealth. And especially when, you know, there are so many different things set up against you, we have to, to pivot that. So there are a lot, tons of programs in, in the AEC industry that are around, you know, uh, kind of minority contracting and all these sorts of things, but it's done in such a transactional and frankly superficial way that is like cutting off a little piece so that you can have some income but it's never about wealth, <laughs> right? It's like, don't, don't give me a contract for X hundred thousand dollars. Give me a percentage of the company. Right? <laughs> so, Thank you. You know, it's, it's, you know it, it, we have to get past that. We have I'm, to get past that. 
I, 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 I'm just saying, I think your, your, your comments are very, very well taken. And I think it will resonate with a lot of people. And it goes back to this notion of kind of the, the requirement investments that we need to make. Um, like, for example, if you look and your presentation gave a historical perspective um, and, and we start thinking about, okay, what it will take. And we have a mm -hmm. question from Lance Brown, um, the president of CSU, um, who is asking, you know, where is the funding come from good design? You know, where are these? And if we have, there are other conversations that are going parallel. You know, the pandemic, has really impacted the coffers of a lot of municipalities, states, and even the federal government. And uh, there is now this competition of, for the limited resources that are going to be available. You know, people are talking, okay, we have to prepare for the new normal based on the pandemic. But what about environmental justice with climate adaptation? But what about social justice? And, and I think what you are talking is, how do we ensure that our actions are aligned with the right work that needs to be done and with the right um, uh, approach. And so one of the questions, if we look at Lance's uh, question in terms of funding, if we hear about all these questions, for example, of investment, and we have heard about uh, transportation investments, and you, you talk about your black space collective in really investing and trying to bring the people from the community to be part of the process, not just to be in the receiving end, but be part of the process. How do you see this in looking, for example, if we were to look at an infrastructure bill nowadays and how do we want it to bring some of the uh, funding requirements to ensure that we um, invest in the communities that have been marginalized and underinvested. Yes, great, great question and, and prompt. And something I'll, I'll return quickly to that history. So I, I shared that project where, you know, in, in you know the the late 1940s, early 1950s, a group of black people did self-help housing construction, built 300 homes that have been able to persist to this day as affordable housing. So they had a model, they went to, to the Senate, went to Congress, federal government, and at that time they asked, okay, we did this with a $1 million pot of money, give us uh, you know, 100 million. And of course the Senate said no, right? And the Congress said no, and our government said no to those black people who had a perfectly proven concept and model. And instead they funded things like paying white people to, to tear down black neighborhoods and build highways and get lots of, get paid a lot of money to do it. So there's never a problem with money. I want that to sit with everybody. Money is not the problem. Yeah. It's how right? people decide so I, I, I yes. just, You know, I want that to sit with everybody because this, this keeps coming up during this. And my, oh, the economy's bad and so we can't do this. It is a lie. And the fact that so many people accept it is very challenging to me. So the, uh, the way that I would, would talk about the moment that we're in now is to think about money in a, in a broader frame again. So typically we think about money in kind of like the capital project, right? This is what it's going to take to, to build the thing but we don't always look over the full timeline of cost, right? What is it gonna take to maintain something? What is it gonna take to uh, kind of make sure that it, it's performing multiple measures, right? That could be re related to climate or it could be related to social issues, right? So having a, a broader concept of, of cost and benefit is the first step and to look more comprehensively at that, right? And a lot of the active design work that was done uh, at, at DDC over the years was, was focused on this along with the Department of Health. Um, and there are a number of different kind of considerations that, that we can bring, but we need more people to kind of step back out of the budget, like get out of the spreadsheet that is, is kind of structuring every decision uh, and, and to think about cost 
in a broader way, which can be economic, environmental, and social. And then dollars are, are, are kind of a measure of, of those things, but we have to like look at it over time, especially. So, uh, you know, how affordable housing, for example, sure, we can build more housing units for less if they're poor quality, but in 20 years, those buildings are done. What, you know, what, what logic does it make to build a 20 year building, right? For something like housing that we know we need kind of over longer periods of time. So, you know, we have to, to change some of those mindsets and to remind everybody that money is not the problem. Thank you. And, and this is a very good way to uh, end the discussion uh, because it is uh, something that, as you say, people uh, always put it in the front uh, as a, an impediment. And I think you're challenging them to think, uh, is it really the impediment or is what you want it really to do? And, and it's more a reflection of your value system of how you want to spend it. Um, so I would like to thank again, <laughs> Justin and Suzanne for participating. Uh, great insightful questions. Thank you so much. Um, I will also would like to thank the partnering organizations, ACC New York, AIA New York, ASCE, CMAA New York, New Jersey, CSU, ENR, NAC, and NICOVA, NOMA for the participation and support of this series. I also would like to thank the past speakers and co-moderators from our earlier series on COVID-19 who are here today. We have Wayne Crew, the General Secretary of the National Academy of Construction, Lance Brown, the President of the Consortium for Sustainable Urbanization. We also have Eric McFarlane, our Dep the Deputy Commissioner for Infrastructure at New York City DDC, Margaret Castillo, the Chief Architect at New York City DDC, Eric Borstein, Associate Commissioner for Public Buildings at the New York City DDC. Uh, we also have Isaac Banunu, the Director of Engineering at DDC. Uh, we also have Eve Michel, Vice President of Development and Chief Architect at M uh, MTA uh, uh, Development and, and Construction. And we also have Kelly Bernard, Executive Vice President of AECOM, National Cities Leader, and a, a former Deputy Mayor of Economic Development at Los Angeles. Uh, Marcos Diaz Gonzalez, Senior Vice President for AECOM. And thank you all for being here uh, today. I also would like to thank all, the, all of you that are there in offices, agencies, and home throughout New York City and around the world for taking the time to listen today. Continuing education credits for architects have been requested. If you are seeking credit, please send your name by email to cbips at columbia.edu. Uh, I would also would like to thank the team at Columbia Center for Buildings, Infrastructure and Public Space, Michael Smith, Charles Cheng, and Rick Bell. I can tell you that without their support and their work, none of this will be possible. And please join us for the second lecture on this series next week on Tuesday, 929 at 12 noon. The speaker will be Mindy uh, Thompson Fully Love, uh, MD. Mindy is a social psychiatrist who explored ties between environmental and mental health prior uh, to join the new school full-time in 2016, Mindy taught at Columbia University and was lectured at Parsons. She has published numerous articles and six books, including the just released Main Street, How a City Hearts Connects Us All. Very important as we're looking at the issue of social justice and the industry. And so I would like to thank all of you again for joining us today. Please stay well and I'm looking forward to seeing you next Tuesday. Thank you so much. Thank you. Justin, thank you, Suzanne, for being part of this and kicking us off in a really good way. Thank you. Happy to do it.